We're talking with Paul Warfield, number 42 for the Miami Dolphins, premier receiver who holds about every record in the book, has made them and will make them again sometime. Paul, tell us a little bit about yourself and your background. When did you first start playing football? Well, Bill, originally I first started playing football uh, back in my hometown, Warren, Ohio, which is a small northeastern industrial community uh, in the state of Ohio. And I started playing uh, on the grammar school level in, uh, in Warren, Ohio. Uh, grammar school football is very popular, and I started first playing touch football and uh, then move right on through the school programs into junior high school, then on up to high school. And uh, my first position that I played uh, in grammar school, ironically, was a, a split in. And uh, later on, as I moved up into junior high school and uh, then to high school at Warren Harding, which is one of the football powers of the state of Ohio, uh, I started playing uh, as a offensive running back. And then, of course, after graduating from Warren G. Harding, I went on to Ohio State University and played as a running back there and played a lot of defensive football also. So you haven't been a wide receiver all your football career then? No, I haven't, uh, but uh, I think that the experiences that I had as a defensive back playing in high school and both in college have helped me immensely as far as learning how to uh, incorporate or make some of the necessary moves and run pass patterns. Okay, now let's uh, get into your professional football uh, career. Paul, tell us a little bit about how all this came about. Well, in 1963, my, after the, my last season at Ohio State, my senior year, uh, I was drafted by the Buffalo Bills in the American Football League and also the Cleveland Browns in the National Football League when there were two leagues. I decided that uh, I would play with the Cleveland Browns primarily because as a youngster I'd followed the Browns and followed all their great stars and uh, like Otto Graham, uh, Marion Motley, uh, Dante Lavelli, Max Speedy and many great stars. The Cleveland Browns are really a big thing in the state of Ohio and so uh, it wasn't very difficult for me to make that decision to join this club that uh, at that time was considered one of the finest organizations in all of professional football. And also I think I decided to join the Browns uh, because Buffalo was thinking in terms of me as a defensive back and uh, I wanted to be a pass receiver. And so that helped make the decision a little bit easier. And so I joined the Browns and uh, had the opportunity to work under one of the great pass receivers in their organization for many years. Ray Renfro in my very first year there and uh, in a matter of six weeks he taught me just about everything that uh, he knew in his 12 years as an active player uh, about pass receiving and running and executing pass patterns and uh, the one thing that really sticks out in my mind about what Ray Renfro told me is that you have to think out on the football field all the time you just don't wait until things happen or rely on ability just per se but you have to sort of think and uh, see mental pictures about what things are going to happen when and how things are going to happen out there. Okay, then from Cleveland to the Miami Dolphins. Well, I had uh, six years of playing at Cleveland, and they were six great years. Uh, uh, you have to sort of picture uh, yourself in that position. And I was, as I said, a kid that grew up in Ohio and followed the Cleveland Browns, and I went up to Municipal Stadium many times and, and saw the Browns perform. And uh, then one day I was drafted by this club, and that meant that I would be playing in that big stadium out there on the field. And so it was very gratifying to play there and to play before all of my uh, fans, you might say, in my hometown to play before my relatives, my folks, and, and a lot of the people that followed me from high school on up to college. And so it was six real good years, but uh, I found that after being traded to the Miami Dolphins, a lot of things happened to me, and it was very gratifying to join a club that had been what you might say or might call a losing club and to see the complete metamorphosis in the rebuilding and uh, to watch this club grow into a, a, a challenging and contending team and then up to a championship team. One of our albums we have done uh, has been with Bob Greasy and now you're uh, on the receiving end of Bob's passes. Uh, we want to talk specifically about uh, you, Paul, and about uh, what it takes to catch a pass uh, in football at any level. First of all, what about training? How important uh, do you consider being in good physical condition? Well, I think whether you're playing football or whatever sport you play, you have to be able to at least go through the physical part of that, and this includes uh, the training. And so I look upon training as being a very important uh, thing in, in helping me to uh, 
carry out the normal functions or a normal uh, uh, normal job that I do out on the pat on the football field. And uh, I work very hard in training, and training is something that helps, I think, a professional athlete and an amateur athlete become a disciplined athlete. It's not easy to uh, go out and uh, do your, ne your necessary running previously before going to a training camp. It's not easy to uh, get yourself in real good physical condition. But if you uh, set up a schedule for yourself and discipline yourself and make yourself go out there on a day-to-day -day basis or two to three times a week, you might say, and then I find that uh, when I do things later on in training camp that uh, I'm in the type of physical condition that's necessary for me to be able to execute the pass patterns or to run 50 yards and come back to the huddle and if I'm called upon to run 50 yards again to actually do that again and again. So I think that physical condition is very important. It's definitely very important down here in South Florida where uh, the climate is very moist and very warm. and. Uh, if I'm not in good physical condition, I'm just not going to be able to work out on a day-to-day -day basis. Paul, getting to specifics and uh, uh, being a wide receiver for the Miami Dolphins, uh, what and how many pass patterns will you run in a normal uh, season? Well, there are a number of pass patterns that uh, a pass receiver will have in his repertoire, I think. I run uh, several basic patterns, and uh, I learned uh, years ago from Ray Renfro that you can run similar patterns and make different patterns look entirely different by just uh, running certain variations. But I stick pretty much to the basics, and uh, I like a slanting pattern over the middle. Uh, it's been recognized in the last year or so as the, the Nixon pass, I guess you might say, <laughs> the one that President Nixon diagrammed in the New York Times. Well, tell us exactly what that is, how it develops if you diagrammed it. Well, it's a very quick hitting pass, and it's a, a short pass over the middle. It's not a difficult pass to run. I think anyone can run it. Uh, it's a pattern in which I break it about 10 yards at a 15-degree angle over the middle, and it's not a difficult pass to throw. Uh, it's a good pass for a quarterback to throw. It's a good pass to catch because I think that a pass receiver has the ability to catch it for a 15-yard gain, or if he catches it and if the defensive backs are sleeping or, or relaxing just at that moment, it can break for maybe 80 yards. And the only, there's no basic moves on the pattern. I just run straight downfield, and then when I hit a point about 10 yards, I break at about a 15-degree angle right across the middle of the field. It's a pass that anyone can run. Uh, any kid can run it. Any grown-up can run it. And uh, I run it, and it's just a matter of timing between the quarterback and the pass receiver. But uh, it's a type of pass that... Uh, as I said, there's a high percentage of completion average on it, and it's been very good to Bob Greasy and myself. It moves very rapidly, too, doesn't it, from the time the ball is snapped? Yes, it does, and uh, as I said, you can catch this pass for perhaps either a 15 or 18-yard gain, and if the defensive backs are relaxing, it can go as far as 80 yards or all the way, and that's the reason why I like it, uh, because... Uh, it, it's, it is a quick hitting pass, and you can break it for the long gain, or you'll break it for that consistent uh, 10 to 15 yards. Okay, now that's the slant in, I think you call it. What are some of the other basic patterns that you'll, that you'll run in just about every game, Paul? I'll also run uh, a sideline pattern. Uh, a lot of people call this pattern an out pattern or a zig out, but it's a sideline pattern. And, that pattern is run down, I run down the field, straight down the field, much in the same manner as a slant in, only I'm breaking to the outside. And I'm breaking as close to 90 degrees or as flat an angle towards the sideline as possible. And uh, it's the type of pattern which is thrown, I guess you would say, in a situation in which you uh, are looking for the little longer yardage, uh, maybe from 15 to 18 yards. It's a possession type of pattern. Uh, another possession type of pattern is the regular hook pattern. And it's so termed as the fish hook. It really resembles a fish hook, if, if you might say, uh, because the pass receiver is running downfield and he gets to the depth about 15 to 16 yards, and he starts to f fish hook inside or curl inside, but it, it uh, resembles a fish hook, you might say. Would there be times you would uh, curl outside as opposed to curling inside? Yes, there would be a few times in which I would curl outside. Uh, 
from a different formation in our particular offense, there, there is a time in which I will hook up to the outside. But basically, I think that whenever pass receivers run a curl or a hook, they're hooking to the inside and uh, hooking, looking around, hooking inside and facing the quarterback over their right shoulder. If they're a left pass receiver, if they're on the lined up on the right side, they're hooking around to the inside and turning and looking over their left shoulder. How important is it to uh, follow the progress of the ball from the time it is snapped from center, Paul? Well, perhaps that's the most important thing in pass receiving. And I just like to say right now that there have been many theories on pass receiving, but basically I think that uh, anyone can catch a pass, and it's not difficult to catch a pass as long as a person has reasonable hand and eye coordination, uh, he should be able to catch the ball. But the most important thing in catching is concentration. And when you concentrate on the ball, you have to see it from the time that the ball almost leaves the quarterback's hand until it's in flight in the air and it rests in your hands, as the pass receiver rests in, in your hands. And uh, so you've got to be able to concentrate. And you've got to be able to concentrate on the all conditions and whatever the circumstances may be. And whenever I drop a pass, I know the precise reason why I'll drop it. And it's because I'll concentrate on the ball once it leaves the quarterback's hand and I'll follow it through the, through the air in flight and I'll watch it come almost into my hands and then at the last second I'll turn my head and start to run then I'll lose it and I'm relying on touch and feel. And so that's why it's important. Uh, it's important for a pass receiver to sort of go through three, uh, what you might say, steps. And first of all, after he releases from the line of scrimmage, to watch the ball come through the air. Watch it, watch it as it leaves the quarterback's hands. Then watch it in flight. And then when the ball comes in flight, watch it come all the way into his hands, catch it, look at it, <laughs> then <laughs> place it under his arm, and then go. That way you're sure that you're going to always catch the ball. Now, anyone can do this. Now, there are, as I said, different theories on pass receiving in which uh, some coaches uh, will say, well, a kid has to have big, strong hands. Well, I don't think a kid has to have big, strong hands. As a matter of fact, if you look at my hands, uh, for a man's hands, they're about normal size. They're not long, they're not big, they're not necessarily strong looking. And yet, uh, I don't have any difficulty in catching the ball. I think Marlon Briscoe, who plays with us also, is a smaller man than I. And he doesn't have any difficulty in catching the ball. Uh, for kids that are trying to catch the ball, I think it, there could be some problems or, because at a certain age of, you might say, development, a kid's hands is, a kid's head, a kid's hands are very small, and the football, of course, is quite large. And so, I would prescribe a method in which I use occasionally to make sure of a catch. And I learned uh, at uh, Ohio State University, Woody Hayes says, "Well, you catch the ball with the third hand," <laughs> <laughs> and that's sort of like uh, I've been uh, criticized over the years for jumping and catching, taking the ball on my body and then squeezing it in. But I've made a lot of short catches that way. And I've noticed that whenever I play catch with smaller kids, that they'll catch the ball that way. And it's a short catch for them because when a kid's about six, seven years old and he has a big football, and this thing is sort of hard to grasp with his hands because they're really too small. And uh, if, if a kid can just sort of practice catching the ball and then cradling it in, I think it's going to be a short catch for him. But I think concentration is perhaps the most important asset in catching a ball and just to watch the ball from the time that it leaves the quarterback's hands, follow it in flight, and then watch it come into your hands and cradle it in. And you would recommend that a young, uh, uh, young kid uh, learning to play football, he, his hands are important, but in learning there are a lot of other important things. Oh, definitely. Uh, until a kid, I would say, uh, reaches the age of... Uh, 13, 14 years old, I would suggest that he catch the ball by working with the third hand. And uh, when his hands are perhaps a little larger then, he'll be able to rely on his own hands and touch and feel as far as that uh, pass reception is concerned. Paul, what about uh, footwork? Uh, you seem to be very, very nimble on your feet, uh, running uh, uh, reverses and things, of like, uh, things like that, as well as just receiving the ball. Uh, uh, you're pretty sure-footed, aren't you? Well, I think footwork is important uh, for a pass receiver, and uh, most of the pass receivers today have excellent speed. But I think that if you have a person that has a great deal of determination and 
and uh, a great deal of desire to excel that uh, he doesn't have to have he doesn't have to be extremely fast afoot or extremely nimble uh, I look back over some of the past receivers uh, in the National Football League and one that really stands out in my mind was uh, Raymond Berry who uh, as far as ability was concerned was shy on a lot of things he didn't have speed he didn't have quickness uh, the only thing he had was a tremendous desire to excel and, and you talk about the things that I've been talking about like concentration on the ball here's a guy that really worked hours on making all the difficult catches not the ones that are easy to catch the ones that come right in your hand about belt high he uh, worked on the tough catches the ones that were low and outside high uh, passes that were away from him and uh, as far as footwork was concerned he didn't have as I said the foot speed and uh, he didn't have the niftiness of some of the other pass receivers but yet and still he really concentrated on running his pass patterns at very precise angles and uh, I think that youngsters today can sort of take a page out of Ray Berry's book and it really applies to football and it applies to a lot of other things the way that you're willing to go after something a particular goal and the willingness to, that you are, are, are willing to put so much effort into it is going to mean so much to you in the long run and I think that if a, if, a, if a young kid uh, wants to be a pass receiver, then he must be able to concentrate above and beyond everything else. If, he, uh, if he's going to run good pass patterns, then he's going to have to be disciplined enough to make himself run a precise pass pattern, a uh, sideline pattern at 10 yards if it calls for 10 yards. Or to make that break of a sideline pattern as near 90 degrees or as flat going toward the sideline as possible. In other words, discipline in just about everything he does. Oh, yeah, definitely. And I think that, uh, as I said, Raymond Berry perhaps was uh, as good as anyone. And Raymond Berry, is, he stands out in my mind as, as the top pass receiver in the National Football League, at least during the period in which I first came into the league. And, and he ranks right up there uh, with the all-time greats. He will be in the Hall of Fame. And here was a guy who couldn't run 100 yards in under 10 seconds. Uh, here was a guy who didn't have the nimbleness that you were talking about that I have. And here was a guy that had one leg that was actually shorter than the other. And, and he wore contact lenses, and he had practically everything wrong with him that you could imagine. But yet and still, uh, over the years, he's ranked with the greatest in the game. Well, I think it does. It makes a tremendous amount of difference if you have a pass, uh, a passer who has the ability to put a lot of velocity or speed on the ball, then it's probably going to cause you to make an adjustment in your pass catching. And, and perhaps a point that I may have left out, uh, and I certainly didn't mean to leave it out, is that you have to really be relaxed when receiving a football. And the natural thing that will happen to pass receivers if if you're receiving passes from uh, a passer who has the ability to throw a very hard ball with a lot of speed on it or velocity is uh, to turn around and flinch into more or less tense up. But if you're going to tense your, uh, your body and your muscles, then you're not going to be able to receive that football. Uh, I like the passer who has the touch on the ball, who knows how to uh, throw the ball under certain conditions. If he perhaps needs to drill the ball in there, fine. But most of the time he throws a ball that's what I term a catchable ball. It has enough velocity on it, but yet and still it's not coming like that fast ball you think about uh, when playing baseball that you feel that you've got to really get the bat around on or really get in position to catch. Uh, so probably whether you're catching a, a passer who throws a extremely uh, hard ball or you're catching one who throws what I call a catchable ball, uh, I think the important thing to remember is that you should just relax because if you're going to relax, that means you're not fighting the ball. And when you're tense, your hands are tense. And if the ball comes in there, it'll just, well, it'll just hit off like a baseball bat and bounce right off of them. Paul, we hear the young fellows talking a lot about throwing the bomb, throwing the bomb, throwing the bomb. Uh, we know that the bomb is a long pass, and we've heard uh, people say uh, some quarterbacks will just put it up in the air and hope one of our guys gets under it. Is there anything to that logic? <laughs> well, the bomb, I think, is uh, almost a thing of the past now. And However, there is a place for the bomb, I think, in uh, each and every ball game, but there are very few times which uh, today it's going to be completed because 
You have to contend with hard charging defensive lines. You have to contend with good defensive backs. I'd like to point out that uh, any youngster that aspires to be a pass receiver, that the most important thing and uh, another important thing in, in pass receiving is to know exactly where he's going to sort of catch all of his passes or where I would say I make my living. Uh, to be a successful pass receiver, you have to be able to catch not only the short one, the middle distance pass, and the deep one or the bomb, but you've got to really concentrate on catching that middle distance pass because that's the pass that's easiest for the quarterback to throw, and that's the pass in that area in which you're going to probably get your highest range of completions. So you've got to be able to catch that pass, and you've got to be able to be disciplined to execute the pass patterns in that particular area. Uh, the bomb is a very low percentage pass. Uh, you have to have a tremendously great passer to throw the ball better than 50 yards or so, uh, time in and time out and complete the ball. And you've got other factors, wind, uh, climatic conditions, and so your percentages are not going to be with you with the long bomb. So I would stress that any youngsters listening, that they would work on catching the patterns that what we, talk, what we just talked about. Uh, the, uh, the hook pattern, which we called the fish hook pattern in a range of 10 to 15 yards, the side line or out pattern, which is about in the same range, and uh, to work on the slant in, which is sort of another shorter but uh, almost a middle distance pass. And if you work on those passes right there, that uh, then they can lead up, you can build up to something like a bomb uh, if, it, if the occasion arises. Paul, we've talked about uh, catching the ball, but uh uh, there's more to uh, being a receiver, be it a wide receiver, a, a man receiving the ball coming out of the backfield, a tight end, uh, or what have you, than just catching the ball. He's got to be able to do something with it after he catches it, hasn't he? Well, instinctively, uh, after you catch a ball, you in uh, professional football or amateur football, high school, college football, or either just backyards football in which kids are playing. When you catch a ball, you're going to draw a company or draw people around you. <laughs> and so instinctively, the thing you want to do is get away from those people and run with it. And uh, I think that's an important part of pass receiving also. And uh, you just don't catch the ball and things happen. I think you have to sort of think about it and sort of see mental pictures uh, or pre-plan exactly what you're going to do. For example, uh, when I catch uh, the hook pattern, I know that a defensive back is probably coming up on my left inside or inside of me. And so instinctively after I catch the ball, I, I start moving in an opposite direction away from his inside and I move to the outside. And usually he'll just, he'll grab for me, but he'll just reach it just thin air because I'm not in that area. I'm moving away from uh, in the direction that he's moving. If I catch the slant in pass over the middle, I'm trying to break for the far sideline and then run down the sideline because I know that uh, in that area of the field, that's where my running room will be. Uh, if I run a sideline pattern or a, a quick out pattern, I try to catch the ball on the run and wheel and turn up the sideline. So I think that if a, a youngster can think about uh, some of these things, but probably he would probably be better off if uh, he just catches the ball first and then uh, let his natural ability take its own course. Paul, what about the times when you are a primary receiver and uh, one of the other uh, uh, receivers or uh, running backs is a secondary receiver? How important is it for them to perform their play if you are the primary receiver? What does this do? Well, football is a team game, and uh, it takes 11 men working together for one particular play to be successful. Now, when I'm uh, running my pattern and I'm the primary receiver, often we'll have the receiver opposite of me on the other side. I line up to my left, the receiver who lines up to the right of me, and, and now it's Marlon Briscoe. He may be running a pattern as a decoy, and Mar Fleming, our tight end, may be running a pattern as a decoy. Now, if I'm going to run a pattern, let's say uh, across the middle of the field, or if I'm going to run my slant in uh, across the middle of the field, that means that their particular function on this play would be to serve as a decoy or to clear that area out. And so they have to run their pattern, their decoying pattern, just as hard and just as effective as I'm running my slant in over the middle. If the, my pass play is to be successful, 
because they have to make the opposing defensive backs realize or feel that they're going to catch the ball going deep to the outside or running an outside pattern anything just to clear that area out of there so that I can catch the ball coming over the middle and so if they're going to make a defensive back realize or make the defensive back feel that they're going to be the number one receiver they have to put everything into it and do something to make a defensive back turn away or get his attention and make him turn away from the area in which I'm going to run the pass pattern. So uh, even though you'd be a secondary receiver, you work just about as hard as if you're the primary receiver. That's right. Uh, as I said, this is a team game. And whether you're involved at the point of attack or whether you're to play your particular number is called or not, you have a function to carry out as, as a team member. And being a part of a team, that's what's the great thing about, I think, about team sports and football in particular. Uh, you have to help out on every play. And so it, it requires, you know, we've talked about the word discipline over and over again, but it, it comes back to you. Uh, and being disciplined in carrying out decoying assignments or whenever you're involved as a secondary receiver. And I also might mention to uh, youngsters out here, sometimes a quarterback may not like what he sees when he uh, calls uh, a pattern to his primary receiver and the primary receiver may not be open. And so if the primary or first choice is not open, then he elects to go to his second choice or third choice. And so the players that are on the other side of the line, or excuse me, on the other side uh, opposite of the primary receiver must run their pass patterns just as effectively so that the quarterback will have an outlet receiver to throw, th throw to. On another area, Paul, uh, there are assignments for a wide receiver besides just catching and running the ball. Uh, what about blocking? Do you get those assignments very often? Quite a bit uh, down here in Miami and when I played at Cleveland, uh, I did quite a bit of blocking because both clubs emphasized the running game and have had great runners. And this is a uh, blocking sometimes can be distasteful, primarily because you're you're, uh, you have to put your head into uh, uh, across another person's uh, legs or put your shoulder into their shoulder and it's, it's the physical contact but I feel that uh, if you're going to play football you're going to have to be able to do everything that's called upon you to, to do really and blocking uh, is, is another way of helping your team and pass receivers as a rule don't block very much but when they do block they're called upon to block linebackers and uh, usually make angle blocks. And um, for uh, the execution of an angle block is more or less just getting your body across uh, a defender and getting your head across him. And uh, in most cases, if a pass receiver can just screen a defensive lineman off for just a matter of a second or two, then he's performed his job. And it doesn't really require or very rarely are coaches asking pass receivers to knock people down, you know, really put them literally on their back. And so uh, mostly screening techniques and uh, just tying up a defender for a count or two is more than enough. Paul, as a wide receiver, I think there is uh, one play at uh, least that I know of in the Dolphins playbook in which you uh, handle the ball, but you are not a receiver. I think that's a double reverse, isn't it? Yes, that's, uh, I think, a play that everyone has uh, in, in their offense, the reverse, with a wide receiver running it. Uh, it's, it's sort of a finesse play, and it's a play that's designed to fool a defensive team. And uh, I think that the most important thing when, to remember when running reverse is that you usually have one or two people out in front of you in the offensive line. And uh, a good point to to remember for for young pass receivers is that when you take that reverse when you take the ball on the reverse and swing wide always stay behind your blocking and and then follow uh, your guard or your tackle who's out ahead of you because he's going to pick up the first man that recognizes uh, the reverse coming back away from uh, the, the flow which was originally going one way and uh, if you can stay behind your blocking then you're going to go at least five ten yards uh, farther but uh, if you don't uh, if you run away from your blocking then you're running away from your protection more or less and uh, then you probably will get thumped pretty hard. <laughs>
Paul, we've been talking about uh, your position as a wide receiver, but uh, for the youngsters listening so that they don't get confused, most of the fundamentals about catching a football apply whether you're a wide receiver, a tight end, uh, uh, someone running out of the backfield or anything. Isn't that true? Most definitely. Uh, I think that uh, perhaps as we talked a little earlier, concentration is undoubtedly the most important uh, thing in catching a football. You've just got to be able to watch that football come through flight and uh, more or less block everything else out of your mind. And when I'm out on the football field playing and uh, concentrating real well, which I hope I do every Sunday, of course, I'm not even aware of the thousands of people that are in the stands. I don't hear anything. I don't hear the cheering. And I don't, I'm not, it's just like I'm in uh, just, uh, you might say, everything else is blocked out and there's nothing that I see or hear except what's going on in front of me on the football field. And when I take a pass, when I have to, when I'm called upon to catch a pass over the middle, I realize ahead of time that uh, there are going to be people there. But my job is to catch the football. And so I've got to block out the possibility of being uh, uh, hit over the middle and hit from behind and just think about catching the football. Because if, if I'm going to help my club advance the ball, then I'm going to do it most likely by catching it. And so concentration plays a very important part of receiving as far as I'm concerned. And then I've got to be relaxed. And uh, with, along with being relaxed, uh, just being disciplined enough to execute a pass pattern the way it's drawn up on the board. Thank you very much, Paul Warfield. It's my pleasure, Bill.